You know, when you look at the at the Bible, there are themes that that repeat themselves. You see that over and over. And one of the themes that you see in the Bible is a constant call from God to return. There is always this sense of God beckoning. He's asking. He's begging. Sometimes it's stern. Sometimes it's kind. Sometimes it's shepherding. Sometimes it's, it, it, it is uh, negotiating. But God constantly is calling people back to himself because we're constantly wandering off. If there was no wandering off, there'd be no, there'd be no need to call back. And so we find ourselves, many of us, all of us at one time or the other, to be honest, that we're, we're here with God, but then we go there and God is then calling us back again. And so today we're going to look at a story uh, about King Saul. Now, if you don't know Saul, if you don't know, there are two Sauls in the Bible. There's two Johns in the Bible. Sometimes it could get confusing. So you have a Saul in the New Testament who changed his name to Paul, which doesn't confuse the matter at all. Then you have the Saul in the Old Testament. So we're going to be in the Old Testament. The Saul, the Saul in the Old Testament was the first king of Israel. Before they had a, a king, it was the, the, the nation of Israel. You would say, what was their their uh, their polity. How did they govern? Uh, how were they governed? And so before uh, they had a king, they were really a theocracy, that God was their king. God was over them. God had provided men that led the, the tribe of the, the 12 tribes of Israel. They were elders. They were, they kind of oversaw the spiritual life and the practical life of, of, of Israel. But then as it turns out that other cultures had kings and whether that was good or bad, it didn't matter because the Israelites wanted to be like other people. And so they came to God and said, hey, we'd like a king. And God was like, not a good idea. Uh, you're you're going to, you know, we operate differently. I am your king. I am over you. But no, we want a human king because we can touch and feel and see him. And and then that's and that just started a whole journey of up and down and up and down and here from there and back again, from here to there and back again. And all of that cycle just went over and over. If you read the book of Kings, there's two book of Kings. There's first Kings and second Kings and first Chronicles and second Chronicles. And it's recording all the lives and some of the kings were, uh, you know, uh, good. Some of the kings were not so good. Some of the kings were really not so good. Uh, king David was a good king, but they were all broken human beings. And that was the point that God was trying to make. Like, hey, you'd rather have me as your king because I'm, I'm pretty consistent here. And a, and a human king is not going to be that way. So I wanted to poll you a little bit. Now, if you don't know the, this Bible story, then don't worry about it, okay? But if you were to, if you do know the, the story and you think about King Saul, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a little show of hands here. Um, and if you think was in your mind, he's good or bad, I'm gonna give you the option of raising your hand on either ones, but I want you to get in your mind. If you don't know the story again, don't worry about it. But when you think about Saul, was he good or bad? So how many would say that Saul, you think, oh, he was good, raise your hands. Wow. Popularity contest. All right. Oh, we got one. Awesome. Very good. Beautiful. Uh, and how many think we're, he was bad? Uh-huh. So you got the. So I would I would probably vote the same. You know, he didn't go down on the I mean, if you had to choose one column or the other, he probably wouldn't go on the good column. However, so I'm in my own Bible reading. I, you know, I do a one year Bible reading program and I'm kind of right here in this this part of the Bible. And I just started thinking, man, what went wrong? Because. It really started out, he was very good. In fact, God is the one that chose him. So the other key player in the story is Samuel. Samuel was a prophet. So God used this prophet to speak and be a spokesperson. And so he went to Sam, God to go to Samuel and say, hey, we're going to pick a, a king that, you know, I'm, I'm giving in, compromising here to these. They just keep bugging me about having a king. So let me let me make the first choice. 
King, uh, Saul was chosen to be king. We're told that he was a head and shoulders taller than any of the other guys. He came from the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin were the tribe of Benjamin were known as warriors. Uh, they were talented in as military uh, soldiers, and so Saul was, you know, had the kind of the credentials. He was, you know, the NBA uh, uh, height. He had the 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 ability to fight. And they knew they were going to, you know, encounter some battles. And so, hey, let's let's pick this guy. So when God comes to him, Samuel comes to him. First Samuel chapter nine, verse twenty. Samuel describes he addresses Saul in this manner that you are the one to whom is all the desire of Israel has turned, if not to you and to your whole family. In other words. The entire nation, their desire now has gone to you. It's going to start out good. And his response is not like, oh, you bet they are. He wasn't proud about it. He was kind of nervous about it. And this is the surprising part of this first part of the story. He's here with God and look at the humility that he has. He says, but am I not, in verse 21, am I not a Benjaminite? That's hard to say in the morning. From the smallest tribe of Israel, and is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me that the, oh, that the entire nation of Israel, their desires toward me, like, hey, whoa, 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 I think you might have the wrong guy. This is also a, a recurring theme, right? When, when God went to Gideon, when God went to Moses, when God went to Peter, they all like, whoa, whoa, they, it starts right here in humility. There's a smallness that we're going to speak about, that they're, they're not giants in their own eyes, but there's a smallness. And so when he says, hey, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, let me kind of fill in the gaps. There are 12 tribes of, of Israel in, in the history of Israel. Again, now, if, if you're like, hey, what in the world does that mean? Because, you know, when you say the word tribe, that means different things to different people. But that's just the way they divided up the nation. And each of those had kind of a character. They had a, they had a you know, a certain uh, bent, uh, uh, each of these nations, so or each of these tribes. Benjamin has a rugged history. Benjamin, and I'm going to modify it because we have children in the room, but they, at one point in their history, there were men of Benjamin that violated a, 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 some females from the tribe of Levites, okay? So we'll leave it at that. So it was a, it was a heinous, heinous act. They were addressed about this, and they they did not handle it well. They didn't. They didn't say, "Ah, oh, man, what are we doing?" They didn't. They didn't. There was no sorrow. There was no remorse. So all of the other eleven tribes of Israel fought against the tribe of Benjamin. In other words, there was a civil war in the nation that God wanted unity. So Benjamin was this odd man out, so to speak, and they were almost annihilated in this battle. They had. They had been wiped. out. Out almost. That's why he says, I'm the smallest of the tribe. So it wasn't something that you'd wear the t-shirt. Hey, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. It wasn't one that was, you know, that you were like, man, this is, I'm, I'm proud to be a Benjaminite or whatever uh, it was. Okay. So then at this moment, next chapter, first Samuel chapter 10, as Saul turned to leave from Samuel, God changed his heart. There was something that happened in that moment. Now, this is really key for human beings because sometimes we see the Bible and God through human eyes rather than supernatural eyes. What do I mean by that? You may have come today. You may have tuned in online today and you're like, man, I got to get my life together. I know that there's a God. I believe in a God. And so what I'm going to do is start to modify my behavior. A lot of people feel like, hey, in order to you know, go to God, I got to dress my soul up. I got to get, I got to dress my behavior up. I've got to do something different in order. So I can't go to church, you know, and, and still be doing. So I've got to stop doing this. It's called Saturday night repentance. If you don't know, right. That is not the Bible invitation. So you can take a deep breath. 
Why? Because we cannot change our hearts enough to be right with God. We are imperfect. The Bible says you can try and try and try and try and try and try, and all of your righteous, sacred, holy, they're, they're, they're like filthy rags. Like, what? It makes no sense. It's completely paradoxical to our human mindset. You see, we come to God, and Jesus called it being born again, which I know in the past has been some political statement. It's not. It's a supernatural statement. We don't come to God and we don't get our relationship right with God because of all the great things we've done. We don't come to God because we start come to church. We are a synagogue or a temple or whatever, a mosque. We, uh, now we're doing that. God's like, okay, now we're okay. No, we come to God broken, bruised, fractured, sinners. And we come and we say, God, there's no way that I can have a change of life from the outside to the inside. And God says, let me change you from the inside to the outside. See, our behavior follows the change of heart on the inside. Religion says, no, you change it on the outside, and then you'll be okay on the inside. And there's a Greek word in the Bible for that, phooey. <laughs> we come in our brokenness, and this comes right down to the message of Christ, which is unique and distinctive above all other faiths in the world. That when, and we don't work our way to God. God has worked his way to us. He died on the cross and he said, it is finished. And he gave his life for us so that we may come. We are clean before God and God has a change of heart from the inside out. That's why you got people in this room that are passionate when they're worshiping. Because like, man, I was lost and now I'm saved. It's amazing grace that God has changed me from the inside out. So he has a change of heart. This is not, you, you will not find anywhere in the Bible that says Saul really mustered up a re his religion and all of a sudden he was a better person. We can't just skim over that. He had a change of heart. He was now here with God. He understood God was going to use him. Now, when it came time to make him king, because many times in, the, in this time, in this part of the Bible, same thing happened with David. You know, you'd have a prophet like Samuel come to you and say, hey, we're going to anoint you king. There's a kind of, a, there's a, this change of heart. But officially... They haven't like, okay, here we go. Now you're officially king. It took David quite a while after God had said, hey, you're king, to really become king. Same thing with Saul, okay? So when it finally came to have all the people come together, we'd call it like the inauguration day or whatever. They were like, hey, everybody came together, and everybody was there except one person, Saul. Saul was not there. That would be weird. You know, if you have a big inauguration day on I'm trying to remember the date, uh, January 6th, that's right, sorry, is that the day, or January, it's in January, where is it, 23rd, 23rd of January, 23rd of January, so if you have ch ch all the people there, you know, they're on the Washington Monument and everything, and they're standing there, and the president's gone, the new president is missing, like, what the heck, where is he, right, so here's Saul, and he comes in, and they're like, where is he, and so when they look for him, in second, first Samuel 10, when they looked for him, he was not to be found. That's weird. The new president is missing. The new king is not here. So they inquired further of the Lord. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord says, yes, he's hidden himself among the, the baggage. Now that is weird, isn't it? He's had this change of heart and he's still feeling unworthy. Now, let me give you a real key secret here. You're going to walk out with something really practical. Here's a real key secret. If you're going to hide, you want to be smaller than the object that you're hiding behind. <laughs> I know, it's profound. See what you learn when you come to church? Because little kids, like, can't see me, like, can, still can, right? You don't want to hide behind a skinny telephone pole, unless you're skinnier than the telephone pole, right? In other words... He's hiding behind the baggage, so he had to make himself small enough to not be seen. Today, we're going to talk about being small. Now, a lot of times that's a negative thing, like, wow, she made me really feel small. He made me really feel small. It's not a good thing. 
But there are places in the Bible that small is a good thing. In other words, we're not big in our own eyes. We're not giants in our own reputation or our own head. You see, Saul, as he started out, he was small in his own eyes. And then we read the story, and he's fighting for Israel, and he's doing everything God has asked him to do. So why did the majority, the vast majority of this room vote him as a bad king? What happened? And so even for me, I was driving, I was listening to my audio Bible, and I was listening, I'm like, yeah, what happened? What was the, not, not just the thing, but the inside thing, what was it? Because if we can look at what happened to Saul, maybe we can either avoid it or course correct if God happens to be calling you back today. See, sometimes we look at the thing on the outside, but remember, this story starts with a change of heart. And it could have ended with a change of heart. You see, David really blew it with Bathsheba, but he had a change of heart. He said, oh, God, I'm sorry. All of us have those chapters, those fractures in our life when God is calling us, hey, it's a change of heart. It's not like I'm just going to stop doing that. What was the heart reason that Saul had headed south, that he stepped off the line? What was the thing that caused him? What was going on in his mind? Well, God had sent him on a mission. And I know this is part of the Bible that's hard to digest, okay? I know it's hard to swallow, but what I'm about to say is hard to swallow. There were times in the Bible where God had to wipe out a culture. And this is where we trust in the sovereignty of God. And some people, they confuse the, these moments in history, like Noah's Ark, where God had to wipe out the entire world with something like the Crusades of the Dark Ages. See, the Crusades were man-made, but God in his sovereignty at times had to wipe out a culture. And here's what we know from Scripture, and I know it's difficult. Number one, God is sovereign. And he, number two, he knows things that you don't know and I don't know. And when we see God wiping out a culture like in Noah's Ark, here's what we can rest in, in a sovereign God that we sang about this morning that's good. Because you know, if you start, if you talk to people that don't know the Bible, they don't got know God yet, like, how can a good God do something like Noah's Ark, you know, and wipe out a whole country, a whole world? And here's the answer. God in his sovereign wisdom and his view and is a view that we can't see, will wait to a culture is non-returnable. The wickedness has gone to a, to a level that it cannot turn back. And, and in that moment, God says, I've got to step in for the compassion of the rest of the world because if I don't step in now, it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and there's not even going to be a Noah left. So there are times in God's sovereignty that he has to step in. And, and if you were in Saul's position, okay? If you were in Moses' position, if you were in Gideon's position, and God gave a crazy command, and some of his commands are crazy, stand at the edge of the Red Sea and just hold a stick out. Feeling great about that. I am really feeling great about that. Gideon, I know you've got thousands of soldiers, but I want you to whittle it down to 300, and we're going to really fight this countless, immeasurable number of uh, enemies with some jars and some torches, and we'll throw some trumpets in there. Okay, I'm in. Man, I'm feeling confident. I'm feeling equipped. Are those peanut butter jars, or the, you know, what are, are they, plastic? Or, you know, and he's not. And so God says to Saul, I need you to wipe out the Amalekites. I don't want you to leave anyone alive. I don't want you to leave their sheep alive. I don't want you to take anything what they have because God in his sovereign insight knew something that we didn't. So at the end of the day, when God gives us to a command, it doesn't matter if we get it or not. When God asks us to give of ourselves, it doesn't matter if we get it 
if we understand it, if we can explain it, if we can write it on a napkin. When God says make disciples, we make disciples. When God says share of our own lives, we share of our own lives. We don't look at our ledgers and say, mm, I'm not sure I can agree with that, right? Saul goes in, he fights the Amalekites. And he does a little bit of what God said. One of the kings, he leaves alive. Some of the, every, if there were, if there were sheep that were sick, killed them. If there were cattle that were lame, killed them. But he kept the best stuff for himself. So it was kind of obedience. It was, it was a, it was a portion of obedience. And I don't know about you, but I am the master at partial obedience. Just enough to make you feel like, okay, I'm not totally evil, right? I'm doing a little bit of what God, or maybe even halfway. You know, if we do halfway obedience, at least we feel pretty good about it. So then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. And these are the exact same words that God used with the earth at the time of Noah. He said, I'm grieved. Oh, man. Those are hard words. You know, some of you know my background is music. Uh, studied to be a concert piano, studied piano for 25 years. And there were times that your teachers get angry. They throw pencils. They, you know, throw the music. They slam the... I mean, it can get pretty rough. They're, you know, at that at that high level, they're like, are you coming in there playing it like this again? Blah, 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 like this. Sometimes they're nice, et cetera. But I had this one guy. And... Uh, and when I was studying in Boston, and um, he just had, he was just an, an, a calm intellect. He never raised his voice. And I'll never forget one time I came in and I played, you know, and it wasn't my best. I knew it wasn't my best. I hadn't worked as I should have worked. And he said very softly, that was so disappointing. Then I karate chopped him. Right in the neck. Just kidding. <laughs> it was the softness. It's often the softness of God saying, oh, man, you're grieving me. Oh, man. The, the Bible, the New Testament says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. When we are when we're here and then we walk to there and God is back there, God is like, oh, you, you're breaking my heart, y'all. See, this goes to the character of a good God. See, God is not waiting. And maybe you grew up this way. To be honest with you, I did. God is waiting for you to step off the land. So, you know, he can break out the ruler and slap your wrist. No, we have a God that loves us so much that when we half obey or quarter obey or disobey, he's like, oh, man, you're breaking my heart because I love you. If you're a parent and you have children, there are times you're like, oh, man, you got better in you. It's not that you're angry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I'm grieved that I've made Saul king. Watch. Why? Two reasons. What is, the, what is the inner thing? Because he, number one, turned away from me. And number two, he hasn't carried out my instructions. It's plain and simple. Sometimes the Bible is hard to understand. Sometimes it's not. Saul, Samuel, was troubled. Think about this. He cried out to the Lord all night long. So, just a few things for practicality for us. Um, what does it mean to become small, and and what are we what are we fighting against? Here's the first thing: when we've gone from here to there, away from God, somehow God has become smaller, and we've become bigger. And those those are going to be your worst moments of life when God is smaller, when you've made God smaller, and God is bigger. Watch what happens. Early in the morning, in First Samuel fifteen twelve, early in the morning, Samuel got up, went down to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. And there he set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. Now, this was the guy that was hiding behind the luggage, right? 
behind the baggage. I just wanted to just want to make sure we have the same guy. And now he's setting up a, a monument to himself. Now, most people in the room, like how many people have made a monument to themselves? Probably not a lot of people, right? I mean, how many people have, you know, have a, a life-size statue of yourself like in the backyard, right? And there's like a bird bath around or something like pr Probably not, right? So we can read the story and we think, well, maybe it's if that, that I'm dismissed from this story. Whew, good. And then he goes on to say, Samuel said, in first, uh, Samuel 15, 17, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? See, that's what God is calling Saul back to right now. And when you look at this, you think, okay, how in the world would I ever make God small? Let me give you some practical things. And, and this comes from personal experience. The things that you're consumed with, they, if you're consumed with them, they become bigger than God. Those can be, big, those can be good things, by the way. There have, been, there have been times where I've been so consumed with work that, that it is bigger than God. There are some times that our families, I've seen people consumed, consumed with their children, and we love them and their treasures and all that. But they are never to be bigger than God. But if all of our life, are we like, man, I can't, I can't be in a group, I can't disciple, I can't come to church regularly because we got this, we got that, we got this, we got that. I'm, I'm here to break some bad news. Your children are bigger than God. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Most people, evil is not bigger than God. It's the things of life. Let me give you a real one. Worry. Worry. This past week I had a meeting. It was unsettling to me. It just I was laying awake at night. I'm like, oh man, I thought we were on the same page. It's not happening. I'm like, I'm what and literally it's 2 30 in the morning. I'm laying there awake. And I said to myself, Steve, your worry has become bigger than God. Because God is bigger than this thing, but you've transferred it and you're wringing your hands and you're counting sheep and you're, you know, you and you're laying there worried so much. And then I, I literally said to myself, I think my God can take care of this. Put him back in perspective. As if God's wringing his hands in heaven like, oh boy, Steve, I'm with you, bro. How are we going to really fix this? Watch this, Isaiah 40, to whom a person, maybe it's a person in your life, will you compare God? What image, what thing, what worry, what concern, what amount of money? What about all the, this back to school, oh my goodness, there's four million layers to that. All those things that trouble us, what image will you compare God to? And to whom will you compare me, God says, or who is my equal? If it were this, there's no one equal with God. But the moment we put thing, one thing, one half an inch above God, we've made him smaller. And God said, come on back to me because I'm not only good, I'm powerful. Whatever that thing that you're worried about right now, God is bigger. Don't make it bigger than God. Someone told me when I was a first, uh, in my first years of being a Christian, I had, you know, stepped off the line. I had sinned. And I'm like, I don't think God can forgive me for this. And he said, uh, the, the person said to me, then you think your sin is more powerful than the blood of Christ. I'm like, okay, I'll zip it from here on out. <laughs> Watch this. Luther was having this conversation with a guy named Erasmus, who was a, theologian and a, and someone says someone asks this question is the you know a dung beetle they can like you know have dig a hole is god in the hole of the dung beetle that was the big massive theolo you know this is what theologians talk about when they run out of stuff <laughs> and someone said that is a silly question god is not in the hole of a dung beetle and Luther said, you're wrong. In condemning as unprofitable the public discussion of this proposition, in other words, you're talking about it, and someone said, oh, we shouldn't even be talking about this, that God is in the hole or in the sewer. And here's his now famous saying, your thoughts about God are all too human. 
I don't know about you, but I do make subtle attempts to humanize God. Because we, after downstream from the Enlightenment, as human beings, we like to figure all things out and put it in a box. And when God says, hey, I'm bigger than that, you may not see it. You may not feel it. It may tur not turn out the way you think it should turn out. But I'm going to tell you one thing. God is bigger. God is bigger. That we can know. Here's the second thing. Sometimes we make God's assignment smaller and we make ours bigger. This is where it's going to get a little subtle. Okay. And, you know, if, if I haven't stepped on your toes, here it comes. I'd like to give you a heads up. In 1 Samuel 15, in verse uh, at the end of 17, the Lord anointed you king over Israel, Saul. Samuel's talking to him. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. And make war on them until you've totally wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you not pounce? Why did you pounce on the plunder? In other words, you took the good stuff and, and did evil. And why do you do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Now watch what he says. This is absolutely fascinating. Because I think he's being genuine in this moment. He says, but I did obey the Lord. We can fake ourselves out so subtly, thinking, especially in half obedience. I mean, we know when we've blown it. If God says go left and we go right, okay, like, you know, uh, Jonah. Okay, we, we pretty much got it, right? But Jonah could have said, well, I did get on a boat, you know, and so, you know, he's kind of feeling good about that, right? He said, but I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission that God assigned me, the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites. And I brought back Agag the king. Well, wait a minute. That wasn't part of the plan. But you're feeling pretty holy about it. The soldiers, not me. The soldiers took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder, even though you're the leader, you're in charge. And the best of what was, watch this, devoted to God. In order, so we kept some of the stuff for ourselves in order to sacrifice them to the, the Lord your God at Gilgal. In other words, hey, we didn't quite do the mission, but we're going we're gonna to sacredize it. You know, we're going to make it okay by taking all the stuff. It's like, I, I, you know, I, I went to the store and I stole $2 million worth of jewels, but good news, I'm going to tithe on those jewels. <laughs> Samuel says, does the Lord delight in all these offerings you're going to give with all the stolen stuff, sacrifices, as much as he does the voice, being the voice of the Lord to obey is higher. It's bigger than sacrifice. To obey, to heed is better. It's higher than the fat of rams. What, do I, what does this mean for us? When God said, go into all the world and make disciples, guess what he meant? He meant go into all the world and make disciples. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. When God said, help the orphans and the widows, that's exactly what he meant. When God said, I want you to have the same mindset as th that of Christ, other-centric, that's what he meant. In other words, if we say, well, here's what I think disciple-making is. Here's what I think an orphan is. Here's what I... No, he meant what he said. So I think there's a message in here of saying, hey, be careful that... You're kind of not making it up so you feel better. And here's the reason why. Not because God's ticked off, but you'll never feel in that rhythm with God. That's the deal. That's the grieving part of God's heart. You're like, I want you to be in rhythm. And I want us to, I want us to be like this. And hey, go and do what I'm saying. And man, you'll, you'll think, oh, this is kind of a crazy command. But when you do, you'll be in rhythm. Here's the last thing. Let me just say it this way. One, one more statement. A holy modification of God, his assignment, a holy modification of God's assignment is not holy. We might, we might try to paint it as holy, but, but God knows and, and we know too. Here's, a, here's the last thing. God's opinion 
can become smaller and other opinions can become bigger. This is super relevant for us. My wife and I were talking about this today. We were like, she said, I'm fatigued. I'm so fatigued of media and the voices that just keep coming at you in a non-biblical world view. Just uh, seems like the microphone has been turned over. And the voices are loud and the voices are loud so that if you say, I'm a follower of Christ, these are things that, that Christ calls us to. These are the things that we're going to walk in, in this way. This lifestyle is not aligned with God. This lifestyle is we're, we're, we're coming into a place of culture that you're going to get beat down because of that voice of, of opinion of God. But these are the moments when we're together that we remind ourselves that God's voice and his opinion cannot be trumped by the opinion of our culture. I know, I know that's tough. Watch the same. Saul said to Samuel at the end of the story, he says, I've sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. Watch. Why was that? Because I was afraid of the people, and I gave in to them. I've been a leader for 40 years. I'm going to tell you, that little statement right there, that's tough. Easy to read, hard to do. As a parent, you know it. When, when there's bras and uggs, and you're like, hey, I'm the parent. I know what's best for you. It's not easy, is it? Holding the line as a parent. But there's something as we end this story that I think I want you to, that I want to catch before we leave. Watch this. Jesus talked about becoming small and how to do it. Watch this. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change, have a heart change, to come back from there and come back here with God and say, God, I can't do it on my own. And I'm asking for a supernatural change and watch and become like a little child, a small child. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven. He's he, in, the, in the context of talking about coming into the kingdom of heaven. But he's saying you've got to become small. Then John the Baptist said it this way. He said, God must, here's the word again, become greater. I must become lesser, decrease, smaller. The word become, I don't know if you, you realize, it's a progressive word. I've become grouchy. That means I progressively have become more grouchy, right? I've become healthy. I've made some choices. And I'm like, hey, I, over time, I'm progressively becoming more healthy. Become is a progressive word. I love this word. Here's why. Because when you walk out the door, I want you to have some hope. Because some of you may be struggling, man, I'm making my word bigger than God. I've made my kids bigger than God. I'm kind of half doing the assignment right now, blah, 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 blah. But don't give up because God is calling you back to make an inside out change so that over time, over time, that's God's grace. That's God's mercy. We make decisions in the moment, but it takes time for God to work it out in us. And when he works it out in us, then we begin to see a, a different change. It's not optional. Watch. Let me go back. If we can put the, the, the we end with this, the um, words of John the Baptist back up on the screen. John 3.30. Look at the words that come before the word become. I must. I must become. He must become greater. I must become he must become bigger. I must become. If Christ is going to work through your life, then we must have this ratio. So we're coming into the time of the year. Carrie, my wife just asked me this week, hey, would you ever live in Virginia again? That's where I grew up. I'm like, I love Virginia. 
What do you love about it? Well, I love the mountains. I'm kind of a mountain guy. I camped in the mountains once. I know that's shocking. Camped in the mountains growing up uh, once a month and then and, and the Appalachians and hiked and did all those things. But you know the thing, if you've lived up north and, you know, you forget the snow, forget the freezing wind, forget, you know, all the you know chains on the tires and snow tires and all, you have to put that out of your mind. But if you've lived up north, what is one of the most beautiful things that you miss living here? the seasons, right? Fall and the changing of leaves, right? So I was reading about that this week and it's so interesting. Do you know that when you look at a tree in the summer, let's say, and the leaves are green and you say, I can't wait for it to become red. We used to have a maple tree out in our yard. It was, it was it's a brilliant. Red. I can't wait for it to become red or yellow or whatever that is, right? Can't wait for that. Here's an interesting fact. The green leaves are already red and, and yellow. They're there. Those colors are in the leaves. But as they die, there is such a concentration of chlorophyll, which makes the leaves green. But as they die, at the, because of the, the days get shorter, et cetera, et cetera, as they die, watch, that chlorophyll begins to go away. And the colors that are already there are simply showing. You see, when Christ makes a change of heart in our life, the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. And the more that we die to ourselves, the more that we're willing to become small, the autumn colors of Christ come out and they're already there. And so you're just a bunch of trees. Now get out of here. <laughs> we have the colors of Christ, the beauty of Christ in us, but they won't show to anybody around us as long as we and our stuff and our worries are bigger than God. So maybe some of you like me right now are saying, God, I got it. I'm praying you'll make me small. Help me to become small. Would that be your prayer? Would that be your prayer? And maybe some of you are looking for God. And you're a nice person. You're, you, you're a good citizen. You do all those things. But the thing that's missing in your life is not to become more religious. Listen carefully. Is to have a change of heart that only God can give you. To become alive and let God do that in you. Can I pray with you? Father, thank you for Christ in us, Christ for us, Christ through us, Christ over us. Thank you, God, that the living colors, the beauty of Christ lives in every Christ follower because of that change of heart where you brought the wind of the Holy Spirit into our lives. It's mysterious, miraculous, supernatural. And unless God, we, unless we become small, nobody gets to see that. The chlorophyll of our life, the concentration of our worry, our stuff, our materialism, etc. All that stuff, God, it just, it hides the color. So we're here today. We close our time together. For some, with a prayer of, of turning. A prayer that would say, God, I, I've allowed something, someone, myself, others, worry, stress, money, apathy, anger, my past, my future, my present, whatever that thing is you're pointing out to us, somehow it's gotten bigger than you. And like Saul, we, we say, God, I'm, I'm, I want to become small. I'm sorry for that. Here I am, God. I'm back. Maybe that's your prayer today. Thank you, God, that you're bigger than anything we worry about. Thank you, God, that you're bigger than any problem we have. And even though there may be things we're walking through, 
God, you've promised us camaraderie. You've promised partnership in this lifetime. And that is big. It's bigger than whatever we face. We pray, Father, for those who have come today. They're looking for you. And they're, they thought perhaps in their mind, even maybe before this talk today, maybe they've thought in their mind, I've got to do better in order to be right with God. I've got to become more sacred, more religious, more spiritual to be right with you, God. And nothing could be further than the truth because no human effort can get us there. Only us, only an internal change of heart. So if as we're praying, whether you're at home, sitting in your apartment, here on your sofa, in your car, listening, or you're sitting right here in this room. If you're looking for God, let me, may I speak to you for 60 seconds? Listen. God is not waiting to reprimand you. God is, is not waiting to slap your wrist. God is waiting for you to come to him so that he can embrace you. And we know this because his arms are outstretched on a cross. And he loved you so much. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love for us, that he gave his son to die on a cross, to give his life so that we might depend on that finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross who died for the complete forgiveness. Think about it. A clean slate. That when we come, we come broken. We say, God, I'm not coming depending on anything, religion, good behavior, being in a church, anything. I'm not depending on anything except Christ alone. Would that be your prayer? Would that be the thing that God has revealed to you? Depend on Jesus. Depend on him and allow his Holy Spirit to bring new life and have a change from the inside out. You could never do it yourself. You can never do it yourself. Why don't you give your heart, your life to him right now? Simply say, God, I'm turning over my trust not going to trust in anything else. I'm trusting in Jesus. Would that be your prayer? I'm asking God for the complete forgiveness of all my sin for a clean slate. And God, would you bring new life in me as I exchange my old life in turn? Will you give me this change of heart that the Bible speaks about? I want to be your child. Is that your, is that your prayer? I want to be right with you, God. And I want to be right with you through Jesus, your plan, not mine. Why don't you pray right now that prayer between you and God, between your soul and God's heart. Oh God, I come to you right now. I change my life, I exchange my old life for a new one. Oh God, change my life. I trust in Christ. Is that your prayer? Thank you, Father, for this day for the ability to come in, to worship you, to love you, to, to give our lives back to you. God, we need it. We need recalibrating. We need reminding all the time. So thank you for always being there, for being, as we say, a good God. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.